Good morning, all of you. Welcome to sixth day of this week-long science leadership workshop sponsored by all three academies and organized by Central University of Punjab. We are left with only six more talks, and uh, today we are going to start with Professor Ellis Chachithara uh, right now at 12:15, and after that, 3:30 uh, p.m. today, post lunch session is going to be by Professor Alok Thawan. And finally, the final session of the day is at 5.30 by Professor Mona Khori Kasabri from Israel. So let us start with Professor Ellis Sashithara with an introduction about him. Professor Ellis Sashithara is Professor of Biology at ISER Pune as well as in Ashoka University. Right now he's based at Ashoka University on Lien from the ISER Pune. He holds PhD from University of Cambridge, UK, and he's also a recipient of the prestigious J.C. Bose National Fellow of the Department of Science and Technology and is an elected fellow of all the three uh, science academies for sponsoring our workshop, INSA, IAS, and NASI. He is winner of the prestigious Shanti Suru Patnagar Prize in 2008. He is elected as associated member, associate member of the European Molecular Biology Organization, that is EMBO, very prestigious organization in 2018. And he is the only third scientist from India to become the, you know, the, the associate member of the EMBO. He is elected as the president of the International Union of Biology Sciences, IUBS, in 2019. He is also steering uh, an international project on the climate change education titled DROP ICSU. And of course, his uh, you know merits. I mean, the award list of awards and achievements are really exhaustive. And uh, thank you so much, sir, to accept our invitation. We are really privileged to have you here with us. And uh, this session is co-moderated by uh, Dr. Yoga Lakshmi Nandabaran. Over to you, ma'am, first. Uh, please unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Felix. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, I welcome the participants also for the first session uh, of the sixth day of the uh, program. Uh, the CV itself, like we don't have to say anything about the speaker. The CV talks more about him. Uh, without any further delay, let's listen to Sir's enlightening speech. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Felix, uh, uh, and for and also to you, Lakshmi, 
for giving me an opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, I heard uh, the audience is very diverse. There are students, uh, PhD, uh, both undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD student, as well as young faculty. So in this wide spectrum, uh, talking about leadership, uh, you know, uh, it's somewhat difficult. I'll try my level best. You know, it so happened that you know each one has their own understanding of what is leadership, and each sector, each domain, each discipline may have a different understanding of what leadership means. So I'll sort of touch upon some of the very basic concepts of so-called leadership, and then I'll talk about um, academic mentorship because my topic today I chosen more about mentoring. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, when we we talk to the talk to the senior people, we tell them how to mentor young people, and we want to talk to young people about mentoring. And the question comes, whom we are mentoring? Right. Of course, young faculty may be mentoring undergraduate students or postgraduate or PhD students. What about young student themselves? Are they mentoring someone? So I thought I'll bring that component too. And also, whom you want to look up as as mentors? For example, you know, we, you know, your MSc students or undergraduate students or a PhD student, if they want some advice, some you know, uh, inputs, suggestions, whom are you going to? I mean, they are the basically you call them as mentors, right? Mentors is not someone you are, let's say, a PhD research supervisor who will tell you which experiment to do, uh, or how to interpret the data, or someone in the class who is going to tell you, uh, you know, very different principles of science, or, or some of the facts related to the science or nature and kind of stuff, right? Mentor is someone beyond all of these things. So, in that context, first we want to know why. In a society like ours, we need mentors or we need certain so-called leadership skills. Then the question comes: really, what is what is leadership means? Leadership skills means, right? Now, to leadership is not because you know conventional understanding of lead uh, or un, meaning of leadership. What many of you may be thinking is leadership means leading people, right? Or leading a project. Or leading, you know, a, a whole nation. Like you, you know, someone is a prime minister, is a leader of the nation. And on what basis such a person is considered as leader? Is is that simply because that person is going to sort of have so many followers, and wherever that person goes, the followers follow. And when when I say figuratively, not necessarily literally, you know, whenever the person moves, people follow. Uh, maybe on Twitter, people follow these days, right? You know, you have a leader and you have a Twitter account, and that person tweets, and everybody wants to retweet, and they're what call as uh, following the the leader. Now, is that what leadership is all about? It's actually not true. Leadership is not about that part. Leadership is about actually leading your life on your terms, right? It's not about tell, helping others to lead their life. As a leader, so that you have subordinates and you help them to lead their life, it's not that. Leadership is about leading your life on your terms, right? An undergraduate student, a student wanting to become an entrepreneur, or wanting to become a scientist, wanting to become a teacher of our particular topic, or wanting to become a biodiversity expert and want to go to the field and look at the trees and animals and birds. That's where that person decides. And then that person will work for to meet that ambition. And of course, you need help from other people, right? But you cannot overestimate the contribution by others. You have to actually realize the contribution by yourself. And that's precisely what leadership is all about, right? So you cannot say that you know I became so and so because of X and Y, right? Right? But that's not. The uh, the leadership is, or you know contribution of yourself. You have to say I became this because I had this ambition. I took certain decisions in my life. I did these these things. But of course, I did get help from others. You have to acknowledge help from others. It's not that you should not. But 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 you have to first realize that you are leading your life on your terms, and then only you would think you will become what it's called leader for yourself. And leadership qualities that we always talk about is again not about you know leading us a, a group of followers. That kind of a leadership is actually 
you know, false leadership. It's for, you know, you know, for building a profession in politics or building a profession in, in you know, let's say in business that you want to be a leader so that other people will listen to you and they will work for you. But that's what not what we want, right? Every individual is an independent entity, right? So why do you think that person should listen to me only, right? And in a, in a, in a true democratic sense, you don't want anybody to listen to you. You don't want you to listen to others. You don't want, I don't want to listen to others. If I realize that what other person is saying, correct, makes sense, because I appreciate, I, I do say yes, I do make do exactly something what other person has done. Because in, a, in life, we cannot do trial and error and, and, and try to learn everything ourselves. Obviously, we have to learn from someone else's experience. That's how humanity is all about. Compared to all other animals who have small brain to large brain, none of them have the ability, the way we learn from others, right? That's how the, the, the humanity is all about, our whole life cultural evolution that we are witnessing for the last 30, 40,000 years in, in human species is because it's easier for us, human species, to learn from another person's experience, not necessarily that I have to experience everything. Because in life, if I had to innovate myself, if I had to learn everything myself, I can only you know, improve myself to some extent. If there are billions of people have already tried billions of different ways of doing something, let's say cooking rice or, uh, you know, uh, you know, make do building, you know, like a pyramid 5,000 years ago, Egyptian built pyramids and the people who built Eiffel Tower 100 years ago or, you know, the, the tallest building right now in, uh, in, in uh, Dubai, the people who built that, they all have gained that in, you know, the knowledge and experience of all the people who ever built some buildings, taller buildings, you know, right for the, from the pyramid days or even earlier, pyramid people also must have learned from someone else, right? You know, how to build a tall building. So obviously we all learn from someone else's experience, someone else's innovation, someone else's thought processes, but doesn't mean that we should succumb to, you know, someone else's uh, orders, so-called orders. And that's not going to be, uh, you know, fruitful or useful or beneficial to any society. In every society, we all have to realize that we have to live on our terms. But there are certain social norms, uh, societal norms, societal rules and regulations we have to follow. Because just because, you know, I have a certain way of living things, I don't want to listen to traffic rules, I don't want to wear masks during pandemic, I don't want to maintain physical distancing during pandemic. That's not what leadership is all about. Leadership are all about is ensuring that you live a life of yourself, of your on your own terms, without harming and your neighbors. Right? So there are now a boundary conditions added. So as you can see here, more you think of the freedom for yourself, you start seeing a boundary conditions. It's, that's precisely the human society is all about, right? There is nothing that you have lost the freedom. You have your independent identity. You have your own set of rights. But at the same time, we living in a set of way of living requires a societal presence. And societal infrastructure, the structure of the society can't be dismantled overnight and say that, you know, that's not good for me. I don't want to live that way. Right? Because then you will not be able to live on your terms without the help of others or society. So you have to have certain boundary condition that you will not cross this boundary condition, even if it's not going to be useful or not going to be, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, beneficial for you or it will restrict your growth. Of course, all of us, you know, have to live in terms of the society. So it will restrict our growth. You know, overnight, I can't become a billionaire. Overnight, I can't become something what I wanted to is simply because there are so many rules and regulations that we have to follow. But otherwise, the society cannot perform well. Right? At the same time, you also have to think that if there are issues in the society which are completely absolute for, because of the old thinking or some superstitions or lack of uh, better understanding of the science behind the nature or whatever it is, right? 
there may be certain norms and you know of the society which will hinder not only your growth as a on your terms and everyone's growth on their terms that's where you can take certain initiative more for yourself at the same time for others too that precisely most of the movements are if you look at all the you know the liberation movement that we have seen in the society because society i'll, I'll come to that in a minute uh, why society can be so complex uh, you know uh, particularly in modern days right it has been always complex since we know uh, what a society is you know since we know you know the the recorded uh, history of a society so what happens let let's take one example like human rights right now recently in the last 10 15 years right human rights has been you know being sort of projected as an absolute value system for any society that should be the absolute value system in the society but still there are many many things which are not conferred to individuals and every country every nation every society is fighting for it right the rights of you know when you say rights it doesn't mean that you know someone has uh you know uh, more rights than someone has less right that precisely what we are talking about in human rights the the basic principles human rights everybody is equal there is no one superior and another person is inferior irrespective of the color of the skin the gender of the person irrespective of their social orientation irrespective of their geographical location everybody should be equal if everybody is equal then the human rights that means everybody has the same rights you can't say you know so many people have these kind of rights and these people have the other rights kind of thing. and once that kind of a society is built automatically everybody will have a leadership skills everybody will live on their own terms because everybody has a set of rights because the societal structure norms recognizes everybody's potential irrespective of their what challenges like physical challenges a person may have it could be visual challenge it could be you know the problem of legs or hands or hearing it doesn't matter what physical challenge one may be suffering what kind of other diseases may be one may be suffering or what kind of uh, you know background you someone may have come from socio economic background but as we move along in a better and healthy society if we have an opportunity to do what you want to do right obviously there will be some limitation some you know uh, you know because you cannot reach out to you know everywhere and and the way you want to but that's precisely what a healthy society should be and we need to build that kind of a society but better understanding of leadership rather than saying that you know i want to become a leader and i have to have 10 followers with me and they will listen to me whatever i say because i have thought of this i am very innovative this is my idea and everybody should follow this idea right this is where we err and we make more mistakes every time a leader emerges of this type the society is actually be detrimental it will be detrimental to the society right if you know we unnecessarily give too much importance to a leader and the leader takes up too much importance for herself or himself and invariably it is detrimental to the society right so a leader or a mentor should be a more like a catalyst right now that person should will help you to achieve what you want to achieve rather than trying to tell you know no 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 become a doctor become an eye specialist because that's where you know you can do good job or if i say as a biologist as a scientist say no no you should become a biologist you should work on drosophila you should be a geneticist and then again say you know do this 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 way and then you will become a great geneticist a great biologist that person may or may not be interested and that person will walk away because that i'm not interested and you know you're not a good mentor a good mentor is i'm finding out what is that person's interest what are the person's potential and then trying to help based on my experience of going through the life if i am certain age reach certain you know stage in the in my career i must have experienced lots of you know good things and a few bad things too so what are the things i have experienced which help me to move forward if i'm happy or if i'm not so happy which are the ones which are the roadblocks or hindrances i faced if i share my experience 
and extrapolate my experience to your path that you want to take. Now, I, had to, I took a path of being an academic biologist, research and teaching and doing research in, in some aspects of biology. But you want to do something else. But I still, my experience may be useful for you. You can extrapolate to your career. You may want to become a physicist. You may want to become you know, an entrepreneur. You may want to become a, a, a naturalist, a biodiversity specialist, right? Whatever you want to become, if my experience can be extrapolated to you so that you take the good points and leave out the bad points. And if I can explain to you well, and I can listen to you well, because that's very important. I should listen to you well, then only I'll become a good mentor, right? Now, before I uh, will go to the interactive session, I'll just make a few more points about why we need a mentor. Do you really need a mentor? Because everybody can ask the question, why can't I take decision by myself? I'll read. But reading is also, you know, uh, meant, uh, looking for a mentor because you, you know, your, your mentor may not be known to you, but you know your mentor because you are reading that mentor's book, right? And so reading someone else's book, for example, it could be someone who is not even exist today. For example, if I read more of Gandhiji's book and try to learn from his experiments, his experience, I deliberately use the word experiments because his autobiography is is, is uh, termed My Experiments with Truth, my very, very favorite book. Now, if you want to learn from someone else's experience, someone else's life, and through reading, then only you are, also you have a mentor. The mentor doesn't have to be a physically present someone in your own organization, you know, uh, someone whom you can talk to or, you know, physically in terms of, right? So, then the question comes, why do we really need a mentor? So as a biologist, uh, I, I sort of will explain it to you from the evolutionary perspective, right? So human species evolved as a divergent species from an ancestral great ape and one branch, our first cousin, chimpanzees, another you know, branch is we, the modern humans. But modern humans are not so recent. Uh, so very recent, but not so old. Although the divergence between chimpanzees and the modern human happened about 5 million years ago, 50 lakh years. In one branch where we are, there are multiple human species evolved and also became extinct. But what survived is we, the Homo sapiens. And we also lived along with other Homo uh, uh, species uh, for some time, as recently as 30, 40,000 years ago, there are more than three human species on Earth. Some, they also interacted with each other. So we do have the genome elements of other human species in our body. It's simply where there was interbreeding between, let's say, uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, Homo sapiens and, you know, uh, uh, Denisovans, Denisovans and kind of stuff, right? Now, the next but what happened in human evolution compared to all other animal evolution is our ability to share our experience with the help of the syntactic language that we have. Although we still do not know the biology of the human language evolution as much as general, the language evolution, sound communication, and how insects or animals, other animals communicate with each other, bird communicate with each other. The, our ability to communicate with other human beings is much more, uh, you know, uh, a complex and much more elaborate compared to, you know, any two animals, uh, you know, talking to each other. For example, we can do argumentation, right? I can do reasoning, right? Vocally, verbally, with the help of sound, I can communicate to you all the thinking that's going on in my brain, why I did this today or why I did particular thing, you know, that particular thing and what is the advantage that can be. Now, this is because of the language evolution. What language evolution has gave rise to is what is called cultural evolution. But what is in the culture? It's in the it's in the air, right? You cannot call it that there is something in the culture which I can physically touch in my body. And every child when it is when he, she or he is born, that particular child will start as a, a, a human being which is not different than a human being before the cultural revolution. The cultural evolution of the current kind that we see is only about 20,000 years old. 
right? No, but although there were some elements of cultural uh, aspect uh, even earlier than 20,000 years ago, but most of what we see is the last 20,000 years. It's simply because that's when more and more people started living together and more and more communication happened. Earlier days, people were living in smaller group and most of them are genetically linked. Basically, they are related to each other. It's like a, a group of animals like monkeys or uh, you know elephants when they move around usually the, the all the members of that group are you know related to each other there will be one or two times you know an outsider may come and join the group but typically they are all gen you know uh, familiarly linked that's the kind of groups human also used to live only in the recent when i say recent in evolutionary very recent but for you it may be typical still old 20000 years ago uh, or for the last 20,000 years or so, people started living in larger group. And the group became much larger, only about 10 to 12,000 years onwards. When agriculture started, people settling in, in a smaller you know, localities because they had a food security. They didn't have to go around looking for food. From hunter-gatherer type of uh, you know, uh, lifestyle, we became more of a sedentary lifestyle because we started agriculture, we produce our own food, right? So in that context, we um, you know, we started uh, looking at uh, you know um, people whom other way would not have met. Right? So for example, as a child, I am born to a family, and that family is always together for the next twenty uh, years, thirty years. It, of 35 years, whatever the life expectancy in those days, 35 to 40 years, let's say, it was much long, it's much shorter than 35 to 40 years. There's no clear evidence of what was the life expectancy 10,000 years ago. Whatever it is, a child would, would not have seen too many strangers unless two tribal groups somehow come to the border and they start shouting at each other, the way we and Chinese did recently. Right? Now, in that context, uh, a child would never have interacted with outsiders. Now, much of your interaction with your own family members, you don't need much language, right? You can actually, you know, have a understanding because of the chemical understanding, because of the emotional contacts you have with your parents. The second part is a lot of physical, you know, what called body language, sign language will help. And everybody is doing exactly the same thing at a given time. So everybody knows each other what they are doing. So you don't, again, there's no complexity of what is to be understood by what other people are doing. But only when you started living in larger group, in a village and a smaller township kind of a thing, you start meeting strangers too often, then you need to understand them better. Otherwise, we don't know whether they are trying to help us or trying to cheat us. What they do is, you know, come in our way. And, uh, you know, what it's like a road, right? You all follow road rules. Someone come from the, you know, those who are going in India, for example, if I'm going, I'm always on the left side. And I see the traffic coming in front of me on my right side so that I know. But if I'm not sure what other people are doing, I may, you know, go and hit someone or someone may hit me. But because there is a clear set of understanding of what each person does, so we, we more or less follow our, you know, uh, safely, you know, travel distances and come back home uh, alive in, in one body, right? So think of a child who has to sort of go around and meet strangers after about five years of life and first five years the child is in that with family, most of the time with, with uh, parents. And when the child has to go, then it has to go around and talk to so many people. There are so much of complexity. Each one is doing different things based on their own understanding and their own innovation has happened. Uh, technology people may do differently. Uh, farmers may do differently. Business people may do something differently. So how to understand this world, right? Because that understanding of the world is not come directly by through the biological, you know, the way we inherit our, you know, the physical features. The cultural features you have to learn every time a child is born. Right? Automatically, the child is not born with, with millions of you know, books, whatever the information is available, born into uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the brain of the child. So that's where the mentorship is required. Because 
we need the child should know the child means all of us are basically child as far as learning is concerned until we die so in every stage of our life we need to learn from others what may go wrong if i do this this or what would be the implication of me doing something to myself and to the my neighbors right unless we follow these thinking pattern right we will not be be productive when you call productive again you have to say that you are living your life and your terms without harming others it's not about making big money it's not about producing lots of papers it's not getting a nobel prize i eventually all that may happen you know in the society when large number of people are there you know some percentage of people will have all those things right we don't know who can get because it's very difficult to plan those kind of things and you know uh, get that done so in that context it's very important that we learn from others and when we learn from others the people who tell us also should know that why they are telling they are telling so that i may extrapolate their experience their understanding their uh, innovation to my life see whether it is suitable or not when i do this and then take a decision then i have achieved the role of a leader right that precisely my uh, take on the leadership and academic mentorship you know last part when it comes to academic mentorship per se which i'm sure it's the same thing whether in the life or in the academy the person who is going to sort of identify what you are interested in what is your potential your potential is maybe in more in computation or maybe in more in uh, you know experimental hands on experimental you have certain kinds of skills to do experiments right or more maybe in theory you may be more in an abstract thinker right an abstract thinker or also important like you know what einstein you know a 25 year old boy if he could you know it sort of come out with special theory of relativity and later you know general theory of relativity right i mean a lot of things is also because he, he he had a lot of abstract understanding of the very different aspect of the natural forces and then finally he put together you know very nice way right so some people may do it without you know direct mentorship some people they have you know indirect mentorship by instein did or mentorship he has written in his many many uh, you know writings that what who are the people who mentored him and kind of stuff when it comes to the actual doing science one is of course is science as a profession or academics as a profession how you get mentors that finally the subject specific you also understand that nothing that we do right is 100% belongs to us right all of us that we are doing is adding a small incremental knowledge the person may be nobel laureate it's still an incremental knowledge the pool pool of knowledge that's added it's a foolishness to think that i had to do a breath through research and in the process actually don't get any where right you cannot de- come out come out of a pool of knowledge and say i will do a breath through research and generate a new knowledge knowledge you know it's you know it's a lot of expands it's like a solar you know sorry a whole universe expanding you can't go out of the universe and say i will create something but to create something you need something that something is part of the universe similarly the knowledge you have to be within the knowledge domain to create some more new knowledge or something new when we say breakthrough it's still a relative how much more you have added how much new thinking it has come out right and so thinking too much philosophically saying that i have to you know do all of these things separately out of my society and everything is not going to help you have to live with society as a true societal person when i say society it could be an academic society in the context of today and i'll end with saying that precisely what newton you know mentioned what newton said that if i could see farther because i was standing on the shoulders of giants those giants are his mentors it could be 100 year old uh, you know a 200 year old scientist i mean not old i mean the people who lived 100 200 years before him his time it could be galileo copernicus and all those people they are the ones who you know provided so much of input to the understanding of physics understanding of the planetary motions and then he put together into a you know something more and then 
you know, push the knowledge to the, the frontiers a little bit more. And that's what he gives credit to all the people who, you know, created that knowledge, right? So I'll stop here and let's have some interactive session. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was actually um, uh, enlightening. Uh, you rightly uh, pointed out what is a false leadership, how a leadership uh, leadership should be, and a leader or a mentor should be always a catalyst. And if you have a, a healthy society, then uh, everybody would have or possess the leadership skills, and the society will excel. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Your your words were uh, actually uh, enlightening. I'm sure the participants also would have uh, enjoyed the session and uh, uh, understood what actually is what actually leadership is. Uh, with this, uh, we'll take on uh, some questions. Yeah, the first question is from uh, Keshav Goel. What are the hard skills and soft skills required for a scientist? Okay. So the soft skills and hard skills, it's not the same as software versus hardware, right? In computers, we use software versus hardware. What you can see physically, it's called hardware. What you use there, in, you, know, uh, you know, you don't see physically, uh, you know, it's written in an abstract way. It's called software, right? But software drives the, the hardware. And hardware without the software is completely useless. And the software without the hardware is also completely useless. Now, hard skills and soft skills, are, you know, can be different in different contexts, right? Your ability to theorize, your ability to formulate an hypothesis, your ability to design an experiment, right? All can be considered as soft skills Con compared to your ability to conduct meticulously an experiment in an unbiased way, right? You make sure that your controls are correct. Make sure that without a negative control being negative or positive control being positive, Right? and not even looking at the results is, is, is your, you know, as a good experimentalist. For that to happen, you need to be very confident that you are doing everything properly, that you are dealing with the experiment. And even if you are confident, if something goes wrong, you should blame yourself and say, no, maybe I didn't pipette it very well. As a biologist or a chemist, we all use what's known as pipette. And maybe I added one microliter more of the reagent then what one should have added, maybe it went wrong, or one microliter less, maybe it went wrong. So these are all the sort of, you know, the hard skills that you need to learn, both handling the equipment, understanding the, the way the equipment functions, understanding how you are, you know, the hand, the one, all of these things should know and consistently should work. And, and, and that basically helps. But, you know, it, again, it varies. For example, if you're a theoretical physicist, then what are hard skill and soft skills here, right? So the soft skill is your abstract thinking. More or less for everybody, soft skill is your abstract thinking, your ability to formulate an hypothesis. But hard skill for a, for a theoretical physicist, you are mathematics, your mathematical methods, how good you are in mathematical methods to convey what you were thought about. Because in, in as a theoretical physicist, generally you convey everything using mathematics. So you should have that those mathematical skills to convey what you're thinking. Otherwise, you know, what you're thinking is, you know, it'll be in your brain, it'll die in your brain, and then finally no one will understand. How do you know you have been innovative uh, thinker, right? So that's why you need both. Finally, communication skills is one thing, whether a mathematical way of communication or, uh, you know, verbal or verbose or, uh, you know, sentence-based communication. Uh, that uh, skill, that's one of those hard skills should be there in all of us. Otherwise, it's completely useless what we do. Okay, so uh, it's a brilliant session, uh, Professor Shishitara, as expected from you. You know, I've been hearing you for quite some time. Absolutely great. You touched upon so many things. Uh, you started your talk from, from the evolutionary legacy. Then, you know, the leadership is nothing to do with the, the followers. And uh, so as, uh, you know, neither about the orders and about the social societal norms that we should all follow. I mean, a lot of uh, interesting topics that you actually touched upon. And without really wasting much of the time, a lot of interesting questions, I can see that. One question, uh, let me pick up one question. Uh, this is from Tang Q. Tang Q. I'm sorry, apologies. I don't, I cannot pronounce your name clearly. It is from Nagaland. Excellent talk, sir. You briefly touched upon evolution. I heard organizational hierarchy in apes. Most traditional or conventional leaders today are dictatorial and masochistic. 
do you think this is a primitive trait of humanity an evolutionary baggage yes not not really not everything is evolutionary baggage because there are uh, you know um, uh, animal groups which live with uh, much more in harmony without any hierarchy they have a better social system and even if there are so called hierarchy called alpha male or uh, you know in a group or, or you know a female you know matriarchal groups there are certain level levels of um, you know a, a democratic uh, understanding and, and and cooperation and sharing everything happens but what we are practice uh, actually when we actually we are practicing unfortunately not what you are just experiencing is actually an uh, something which has evolved in human as because of our cultural evolution and when you say evolved it's not biological evolution it's something emerged more often what we hear today is a deliberate attempt right to become a leader and to become uh, you know a dictatorial way at the cost of even lives if you cannot you know if you can't even if i understand if you know you want to be uh, someone uh, who should have a uh, you know a little bit more food in a group or you know uh, you, you know uh, you should be the first one to reach the place where there is a food that's one aspect of leadership which is somewhat more uh, there in other animals too but not necessarily in every case for example uh, a leader many times is the one which goes front kills the prey and then first allows the members of the group to eat and then it will eat the remaining one the other members will eat le less but they will make sure that there is something is left for the leader the then leader is taking a risk here leader is going and the higher in the group and the herd and trying to kill the prey but we know that the around that time this you know the leader may also get into some danger or prey may run so fast then leader has to run so fast behind the leader is going to get into a physical problem the muscles may degenerate it may get into a, a fall which may break bones and kind of stuff that's what, that kind of leadership is different than what we are experiencing today in the today's experience we push someone else's life for us right someone you know i take a decision it may lead to war but i don't want to get into the war the i push our my followers you know go and fight the war and this is good for the your life you, tomorrow you will get go to heaven if you you know get killed in the war right this whole is is very corrupt way of uh, looking at the leadership so it's definitely not biological it's more cultural so uh, our next speaker professor thawan is also on the panel so in case you want to ask some uh, question or comments uh, you are welcome sir hi hello so, yeah over to dr yogalakshmi for the next question hi hi um Shashi, I really I, enjoyed yeah, your talk. Uh, fantastic! I think the way you have put uh, leadership into perspective, I think it's phenomenal, and and how we've grown up. Uh, I mean, I think uh, I'll be talking later uh, after lunch, perhaps. But I think uh, leadership, if you just break it down into its parts, I think if you look at the word per se, leadership could be the ship that leads the pack, as you rightly mentioned, uh, selflessly trying to. to create a path for the others to follow not necessarily follow but at least clear the path so that others can move uh, at a much rapid pace i think uh, brilliantly put by you in in your lecture and, and uh, congratulations thank you thanks a lot yeah yes next question is from dr abdul hamid uh, he is asking is there any role of instinct or hereditary impact on leadership quality or is it just sharpening by uh, by the circumstances or it's a blend of two can you uh, is the first part the second part i understood if the circumstances what the first part so he is asking whether it is a role of any instinct instinct yeah no no so i mean instinct uh, is a word that we use in a very loose way see the brain is pretty rational right that we all have evolved biologically we evolved to have a brain and the what brain does is to you know it receive information using all the sensory organs process the information and takes a decision to what to do or what not to do right and this is is rationality of this brain is there in all animals including you know all the insects all the way up to us and people have you know experimentally shown how rational decision every one of 
the decision is. Otherwise, you would not have seen, you know, this many, many species continuously living for a very long time and facing lots of circumstances. Like, you know, there is a local swarm right now. It's a small insect. If it is not rational in its decision-making processes, right? And then you would, you know, would have become extinct by now, particularly desert locusts, which, you know, they live in a very low, uh, you know, uh, 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 abundant for, for food, right? And that's how they uh, go on a migration. Coming to human, we have an additional element in our evolution is the what is known as consciousness, being aware of what we do, right? Many times, even as recently last week, there are some fantastic experiment people have done that many things that we do, even in so-called cultural domain, is actually we are not aware that we are doing it, right? We as Ramchandran and all have done fantastic experimental you know, aspect to it. But when we put, when we can reason why we took a decision, right? Then we say, I have taken rational decision. And when we can't, because our brain processes sometimes any information, it doesn't come to the conscious part of the brain, but you cannot reason out why, you know, that decision I took. We call it as an instinct. It's just because I can't give an explanation. But brain will follow a certain rational way of processing information, pros and cons of everything that has come to your brain based on your current sensory perception and also previous memory, uh, you know, that's there in the brain. And that's what we call as instinct, right? Finally, every decision has to be done with rationality. So even if some time we, an instinct comes to us because simply thinking that you know, we don't know how the brain took decision, we need to verify whether my decision is going to you know, give the results that I want. Like I would do, in, you know, particularly it's easier for academic people. That's how we do all our academic work, right? I want to design experiment. I, I do an hypothesis, frame an hypothesis. I also look at what if my hypothesis is wrong? What if my results will come out differently? And I will have plan A, plan B, plan C, alternate hypothesis, alternate way out. Similarly in life too, when you take decision, you can always experiment theoretically or imaginatively. You can put it in very different context and see what if next year, things will go wrong. What if the economy falls down? What if all the colleges are closed because of pandemic? What would I do? So at every step, you can take appropriate decisions by what you call forecasting. That's something what humans can do. Most other animals can't do. But only, there is still a lot of unexpectedness will happen. That's okay. I mean, see, when we say when we live on our terms, when living on our terms means we are not dictated by other human beings. But if we are dictated by nature, when we have an earthquake, something happens, what can we do about it? But still you are living on your terms. It doesn't mean that you have to live on your terms and you control the whole earth, the whole universe kind of thing. Right? You have to be part of the system. The system is somewhat dynamic. Lots of changes will happen. Many things in your, not in your control. Economy may get shattered. Uh, you, you, know, you know, whatever happens. But it's okay. Even getting, you know, for example, young students who are here may be thinking of getting admission to PhD in, let's say, in a, in a top-notch place. Irrespective of how well you do, if someone does even better, that person may get admission. You didn't get admission. But I don't think one should consider that, you know, I didn't do well. You know, many times, as long as you have taken the right decisions, you have, you know, had a, you know, working on your terms, and I keep saying, if you didn't get into admission to Harvard, MIT, Cambridge, or uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, NCBS or IAC Bangalore, it's okay. I mean, you know, but you, because there are billions of people and and everybody is you know looking for the similar kind of opportunity, and then someone will go, someone will not go. But that's not the end of our life. That's where again our leadership quality should come, saying that it's okay. I didn't get to MIT. I go to somewhere else, but still I leave my. Okay, here is the next question from Sarup Vishwas from Dikha in West Bengal. I have heard that traveling is the best cure of racism. To have an inclusive worldview, exposure to different cultures might be essential because that fosters intercultural communication. Do you agree? Yes, very much. In fact, we learn so much. In fact, see, one of the good things about academic life is our academic input, what knowledge that we gain, come from so many different, of course, you have to be very objective and learn from everybody, not just only from today's literature, also earlier literature and everything. Then you realize that the Greek have contributed, like, so take the science, right? 
maybe you know some aspect has come from china india then uh, so arabian countries middle east then uh, greece and then went into europe and then they added everything but what we today as you see is on the foundations of every cultural practices before all of these things the use of fire use of clothes right cooking methods you know making tools stone tools or variety of different types of tools was there in you know much before we even came out of africa it's already there you know and in fact if you look at the the evolutionary you know some kind of a complexity of in terms of cultural complexity post human biological evolution 80 to 90% of cultural complexity is already evolved in african uh, settlement before even came out of africa to other places right so we have learned from every you know culture every you know populations and again the race is the biological world and we are unnecessarily using this the race is again you know something which is biologically uh, we, we use this for animals and and plants and microbes are different races when they are not intermixing so easily we are not evolved to become races that the the the, the fertility of uh, you know people marrying from very two distinct geographical locations or their children their fertility levels is so the same irrespective of whether two english woman uh, sorry uh, people marry or two japanese or one african one japanese or one american and one uh, uh, african it's the same so there's nothing like race in right now in the human society um, next question is from rishabh nag do you feel the societal norms in india has a lot to do with one's shaping of ambition the challenges are many how to overcome that uh, repeat the question please yes sir do you feel the societal norms in india has a lot to do with one's shaping of ambition the challenges are many how to overcome that okay so it's true i mean uh, you know for whatever the cultural reasons um, or uh, political reasons over a couple of you know millennia uh, we have put too many terms and conditions in our society when i say there are certain terms and conditions everybody has to follow otherwise you cannot live in a society because you have to cooperate there is some always someone has to work in a team give and take kind of a situation right you cannot do everything yourself and you share the uh, labor and you share the product of the labor right that precisely what the society is all about otherwise you cannot have to call it as a society i know i can be just on my own individually and live separately but i can only live to some extent i cannot live you know beyond my own personal expectations as a society i can live even beyond my personal expectations people should realize that living in a society means you are already you know gained a lot you know every day is a challenge to survive person who is living in a society who live live for 15 years 20 years 30 years 40 years right still has food two meals a day that means you are already gained a lot in the society so when you say you know break the societal barriers it's only something which is incorrect based on today's understanding of the world we cannot blame who 1000 years ago who were framed those rules today we have to blame ourselves that we have a better understanding of the society you now better understanding of human rights build human life human physiology human languages and if you are following the same traditions which is set by 1000 year ago by the people who thought that sort the society should be and we are the foolish we they are not the foolish the people who created the caste system are not we cannot blame them we have to blame ourselves because we are still practicing the caste system because we have a better understanding of life better understanding of the nature better understanding of the universe and if you are still following the same old caste system and we are the most foolish people not the people who thought of it 1000 or 2000 or 3000 years ago because their understanding of the world and the universe and human species was so different and you know why we should we blame them we should blame ourselves because we are practicing Okay, I will pick this question from Asiya Siddiqui from Delhi. Book as a metaf, uh, book as a mentor is an amazing concept. Gandhi is the story of my experiments with truth is a book I always wanted to read. I will soon read it. Could you please share some of your other all-time favorite books? Perhaps some books with good mentorship messages. Huh. 
So, uh, okay, so it's very interesting, you know, I, I have not read so many autobiographies yeah. to call that, you know, I use the books. For example, what I meant by mentorship is, for example, if I read, right, uh, you know, process of discovery, right, by someone has written, right, for example, you know, let's say history and philosophy of science, there are so many books on that one, or if I read a novel, right, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a biographical book. Right. If I read a novel, right, let's say, you know, uh, you know, someone like Dostoevsky or someone like Prem Chand in India or Rabindran Tagore or, uh, you know, there are many, many good you know, writers in every language in, in every society and in India. too. And if I read and if I, you know, learn from them, gain from them, something I appreciate and then something I get a feel that, oh, this is what I should do. Right. That means that author is already my mentor. Right. So, of course, I mean, if I had to list my favorite books, uh, you know, uh, that becomes my personal opinion. Uh, I mentioned Gandhiji's experiment, uh, my experiment with truth uh, as, as part of my talk, but definitely it's still my uh, most favorite book. Even Gandhiji's another book, Hind Swaraj, he wrote when he was still in, in his early uh, 50s or just about when he was 50 year old. And he had not seen India as much he saw later, but he wrote so much about his concept of, you know, what his freedom means. And he was not talking about freedom from British, he was from freedom from ourselves, freedom from our own societal, you know, uh, conflicts, which are, you know, accumulated over time because of ignorance and, you know, and sometimes deliberate dictatorship. So I guess such kind of books is one. As we all talk about novels, of course, Premchand, and many, many Kannada writers in my language, you know, I, I, my mother language is Kannada. And there are fantastic writers. And I, I love reading all of those books. The next question is from Ganesh Krishnan. What is the role of social media to shape leaders instead of misguiding the current generation? Huh. Okay, so it's interesting, you know. Uh, it's a time, uh, you know, how we all have uh, experienced, you know, explosion of information and cultural, uh, you know, diversity. So when initially people were, as I told you, living in smaller group, much of what the other people uh, thinking or doing, you can actually understand simply by looking at them, not necessarily even to listen to their talks. But slowly they have to explain to us why they did something because you know the rationale was not very obvious and they had to explain that's where the language became important but when the script was invented people could write something and and transfer the information to another geographical location without physically going there right so you can learn from someone else's innovation thinking rationality by just reading something then it also not just longitudinally going to some other else, vertically also. For example, someone wrote a script 5,000 years ago in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Now I can read it. Even after 5,000 years later, I'm learning from someone else's thinking. This is the way information was processed and this one. The only the good thing about that time was information was coming slowly and we were assimilating slowly. There was enough time for us to you know, look at and cross-check every bit of information because there will be always conflicting information. What comes from the west, what comes from the east, what comes from the south or north, maybe somewhat different. And we need to, you know, compare different pieces of information, assimilate and make ourselves some judgmental thing that, okay, this is what I want to do. If I had to hunt, uh, you know, uh, a whale or if I had to hunt, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a hedgehog or if I had to, uh, you know, go and uh, grow lots of mangoes in my orchard. But when the internet and other things started, it, it started exploding so much that information overload. There was hardly any time to think. Then what you do is you get an impression. Okay, this is an interesting thing. You simply, you know, consider that interesting and then forget about something. But the problem with the social media is not only you, what your impression about it, you simply forward it, right? Now, many times, you know, you know that, right? A, a, a very well framed lie or fake information 
is very often is also very attractive because you know the person who wrote it that person knows it's fake obviously the person wants other people to believe that it is true the person will actually put more effort to convert a fake into true news right for example if i am saying something true and uh, this is what i experienced this is what i thought right i simply write in two three sentences i don't i know try to explain but i may not try to make it more colorful that's why science is less colorful right many people say science is blind your communication is very blind it's true because many times oh, i know how you like you know dna is a double helical structure right and this is what it is and it has you know this so many turns and this and this many angstroms and there are atgc you know wave base pairs and everything we go on explaining it it look may look blind because that's what we are trying to explain but if i am trying to explain something abhi i am no it is because person who writes the 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 false things knows it's false in, in respect who else is talking about it. that person makes it as decorative as you know uh, you know uh, acceptable by the reader and they forward it and then if i am not a rational enough if i don't you know look at properly the what that person is saying i just keep forwarding it then it becomes a viral that's why fake news become more viral than the real news so you know this is something we have to understand that social media is cannot be your mentor so unless you have ability to compare your thought processes with someone else's thought process because you need to know what is other person thinking why that person is thinking that comes when you read elaborately in a novel in a lot you know long writing or in a in a textbook compared to a 160 character twitter message right you cannot understand someone else's thought process then in the process what happens is you know you cannot get any mentorship from another person in the world because there is no way to cross check your way of thinking with someone else's way of thinking and then you cannot make you know a, a new way of thinking which is which is more realistic so uh, yes so reading without forwarding i mean uh, forwarding without reading and uh, of course you know the deliberate forwarding the fake news so you touched up on really important message and let me also pick up another question also associate uh, question uh, again about the fake news in the social media is by swatha from mumbai you briefly mentioned about masks and physical distancing but none in my community here in thara we are wearing mask or maintaining physical distancing reason is hundreds of message we get every day through whatsapp and facebook about how masks cause hypercapnia and hypoxia and uh, how we should not follow physical distancing rather we should mingle more to increase the herd immunity as someone associated with nc covid what is your take on these arguments oh dear so uh, i thought today i'm going to talk about more about learning from each other rather than <laughs> specific about covid um, i mean this is about the science of covid right the two aspect i think i'll leave that to another speaker um, uh right now it the last you know another one minute i can't explain all about covid what i will do is okay. to explain why still people are not following irrespective of the the you know so much of bombarding is happening that wear mask and maintain physical distancing right from march the automated message comes every time we make phone calls or television newspaper everywhere it comes is very one is simple at the same time it's also equally foolish the reason simple is we all make a picture of a world based on what i see or what i hear or what i understand right that picture of the world is based on my sensory perception in my sensory perception i cannot see a virus right the same thing you know people believe that it is a earth which uh, sorry sun which moves around the earth until galileo thought of it even today no one has seen it even galileo never saw that it is the you know earth which is moving around the sun he only interpreted using variety of different kinds of observation he made that his observation will only tell is will hold good only if it is earth which is moving around the sun right so even with all this technology we have space technology no one has ever seen this but we we all now believe is because there is a rational way of you know explaining this and people have you know accepted it similarly the viruses which are basically so microscopic 
you know, my, you know, looking at the bacteria, pathogenic bacteria is still 150 to 100, 200 year old phenomena. Viruses is less than 100 year old phenomena in the society. So unless you're a biologist or a scientist, you know, you will not, you know, realize that why, you know, everybody is, you know, I don't see any virus. Why should I wear a mask kind of thing? As if, you know, at least in case of pollution, people are more reactive because you could actually see, you know, the, the air is very thicker, you know, the, there was no uh, visibility in the, in, the, in the air. So, you know, you could actually see that something is there, which may be bothering us, so you can wear the mask. But virus, what is there to see? What is there to even indicate? People, particularly uneducated people who cannot understand this, it's very difficult for them to follow. So we have to educate them using good analogies, right? In fact, it so happened that, you know, one, like the way Galileo predicted, it is the earth which moves around the sun. People predicted there are something like viruses even before, you know, anything was known about the virus physically, right? Even Spanish flu time, hardly anything was known about virus, but people were wearing masks. People realized that something infection is going on, which we cannot see. It's not even bacteria they need, right? So I think it's in our all of our students and whoever is listening to this, every educated person who has understood the importance of wearing masks to explain to others why we have to wear masks, right? And we can't blame them if, if they're not wearing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's one question from uh, Rekha. She's asking, what are the cutting edge in initiatives one has to take to lead others and be a successful leader? To lead others? Yes, sir. Lead others and be a successful leader. In my life, uh, you know, I don't want to talk about leading others. No one should lead others. So then I will pick up the one one uh, uh, perhaps last question because we are already uh, you know the time is already up. So Mathurima from Salem is asking, who were your mentors in your life and what motivated you to choose a career in developmental biology? Okay, that's a good question. In fact, I wanted to touch upon this, Felix, you did mention yesterday that I should touch upon, I forgot about it. Uh, so, uh, again, my first set of mentors, obviously, my parents, is very obvious. My father is the one who never bothered to ask me whether I'm going to become an engineer or a scientist or, you know, what I want to do. In fact, you know, for everybody's life in India, 12th standard is the most important thing, 12th standard examination. And, uh, you know, one week before the, my final examination, I was reading novels, not my textbooks. And he never bothered. And he even used to ask me, you know, have you read this? Have you read this? And kind of stuff. And then I chose, you know, whichever the degree program I wanted to go, he only facilitated what I was interested in rather than trying to say, oh, why don't you go to engineering? There are better jobs there. Or instead of going to biology, you know, uh, in the academic domain. That's one aspect. The second is because I read books and I used books as my mentor and the authors of those books as my mentors, one aspect. Third is direct mentors in my academic life. My PhD supervisor, again, well, she knew that I cannot think of a set of experiments in a particular area because I'm new to the field. So, of course, she gave a project within this big project. Can you do some of these kind of these experiments? This is how you should do experiments. You know, this is how you should uh, run and this equipment and this is how one should do x-ray you know photography and kind of stuff but but that uh, she also gave me so much freedom to start innovating at every step i didn't have to ask her shall i do this experiment or shall i do that experiment and it was my decision you know to whatever the way and at the same time i whatever i did she encouraged me you know say okay go and buy this kind of a thing and she trusted and the last thing she also did was when, when we put together a manuscript and she sort of realized that this manuscript has more of my contribution than hers. And then she said, okay, you know, you should become a contributing author. My first paper in my academic lab, I was you know, a contributing author rather than simply a, you know, an author because of the student and not a supervisor. So all of these things were clearly help, you know, gave me an, that this is how a good mentor should be, right? And subsequently in my life, you know, I always had that kind of people and always gave me the freedom, they trusted, go ahead, do whatever you want. 
you know, as recently as when I was sitting in I I Pune for the first ten years of my you know living here, the very first director, he gave me so much of freedom and trusted, and to an extent that I used to take decision without even consulting him on which has a monetary a financial implication to the institute to the crores of rupees, with the confidence saying that my rational decision he will accept because with that much freedom he has given me. Right. So that's the kind of mental, you know, shape my life. Yes, sir. We have one last question. Huh. Uh, it's from Vedika uh, from Bangalore. Uh, she's asking a general notion in India is that private universities are inferior to public, which is in contrast with that in US. Harvard, Yale, Stanford, etc., are all private. How was your experience in Ashoka? As someone who switched job from a premier institute like ISER Pune to an emerging private university like Ashoka, can you share your experience? Uh, where uh, were you talking? Uh, uh, sorry, were you taking a risk? Would you suggest such a shift in the present scenario? Okay, so you know I have I've spent a lot of time in in public policy also. One of the things I'm also very much interested in is in the educational landscape in India. So one of the problems of the educational landscape in India is we, we have a large uh, demographic population which need to be educated at very different levels and and also at you know uh, at different numbers of people may be interested in different things you know whether it's law or economics or science but it's coming to science right now the number of people wanting to do high quality science are much more than the number of organization where your undergraduate teaching is integrated with research right so what happens is because research is expensive and most go into a, a, an easy way that i'll do only use the textbook teach and give an examination and if you pass you'll get a degree there are how you know 99% of our students are going through undergraduate students right but that's not good education good education is where the the process of knowledge generation is actually taught and that experience has to come to our students. Otherwise, they're not be able to develop the, the, the most important skills that they need to develop are self-learning, analytical ability, critical thinking. These are the three, four different things. They will not learn unless they participate in doing research or at least a researcher who has so much of vast experience in doing research, the way they teach will be so different and that teaching research integration should happen. Now, because the government cannot cater to a larger population of that quality education, it's very important that the private universities and colleges should do it. The reason private university colleges is many one is of course you know not many good people are going to private universities, and the second is they are not putting enough money on research. And Ashoka was a refreshing change where they have considered Ashoka as a research university. The level, quality of teaching and research they want to do is is should be as good as anywhere in the world, and the kind of infrastructure they are building for research is similar to what you would see, you know, in best places. And when I went there, I know I went there to make to participate in that kind of a an emerging new type of institute in India. If when it becomes successful, more and more people will will hopefully you know emulate that particular. Uh, model because they see because there is nothing wrong in seeing, seeing that sustainability is very important. You know, will you be sustainable for a very long time with so much of expenses incurring? Right. So you have to have a so-called business plan. This business plan not to make profit in education, but to make provide quality education for a very long time in a sustainable way. To end that is what I am trying uh, along with many other people uh, in Ashoka, and I am very happy with that. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, over to Dr. Khalid. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. It's a, it's an absolutely wonderful session. We are really sorry. I think we have already offshoot by, uh, you know, I could see that six, uh, you know, almost 14 minutes. So thank you, sir. You actually came much earlier. Like you spent a lot of time with us, and we we are really really privileged to have you here with us. And it's absolutely amazing session. And because you know we actually learned a lot of interesting uh, side of your your own personal journey and more about mentorship. And um, definitely a lot of questions we really don't have any time. And yes, uh, I yeah I am asking them to post those questions in the YouTube. 
So maybe if you get time, you can just go through those, you know, those questions as well. So maybe some interesting questions are there. Thank you, sir. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And as a, you know, part of the organizing team, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and joining. Over to Yoga Lakshmi. Would you like to add some points? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, your uh, talk itself shows like uh, how experience, so much of experience, so much of knowledge you have. And thanks for sharing uh, your experiences and knowledge with our, uh, our audiences. And we are uh, humble, honored, and privileged to have you today here. And it is actually so nice to uh, listen to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks. I also enjoyed uh, talking to all of you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, for for uh, uh, participants, our next session will start at 3.30 by Professor Alok Thawan. And uh, it's going to be another exciting session. So please join at, at 3.30. Okay. So goodbye till then.